start the recording. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first meeting on Zoom for EDUU 512, The Art and Craft of Teaching. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, we are going to go quickly through um, the lecture because, well, I only get you for an hour a week. And uh, I don't know anybody who can be a great teacher in one hour a week of uh, conversation. So I try to cram as much as I can into this hour. And I hope that you pull a lot from the online content in the class. I am available um, via text, telephone call, or email. If you ever have any questions, even well beyond that, th when this class is over, um, I, I always make myself available to former students to help you um, with anything you need, because I think we're all in it together. We're trying to help the same kids. So anyway, ready to get started. My name is Scott Borba. I've been teaching this class. Um, this is my sixth year teaching this class at Brandman. Um, I am the superintendent principal of the Grand Elementary School District in La Grand, California. It's a South Merced County. It's a small country school out in the middle of very high agriculture area. Uh, about 98% of my students are Hispanic Latino. Same population is um, free and reduced lunch. So high poverty, high Hispanic Latino, about 45% second language learners. I have a wonderful staff of dedicated teachers and classified folks and uh, doing a lot of good things out in the out in the country there. So um, this is my 13th year in administration and my 19th year in education. So yeah, I've been in administration longer than I taught. I crossed over to the dark side at a young age. Um, but I don't regret it. It's been great. I was called to it. So uh, it was just, you know, I enjoy the leadership. I enjoy having an impact on a, on a grandiose scale, having more kids that I can connect with and build relationships with is something that excites me. So a lot of times in this, as I've taught this class, a lot of the feedback I get is people can tell that I'm excited about the work I do, and hopefully you'll be able to tell the same thing. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Like I said, I don't want to take too long on my agenda, two minutes for my introduction. So we're going to get rolling. If I can get my slideshow to, there we go. So what I want you to do is close your eyes for a second. I know I can't see you, so bear with me. Close your eyes. And I want you to think about your favorite teacher. Back when you were in elementary school, junior high, high school, I'm sure you can see them. You, you probably can even smell the classroom, whatever it was with paste or whatever it was construction paper or some cleaner or something, sanitizer smell. What about that person makes them your favorite teacher? Why were they your favorite? Go and just type that in the chat. A couple words. Absolutely. Somebody who's enthusiastic, excited, caring, loving, interest in students, passionable, kind, real, energetic. These are, you notice how I'm putting in here. You see, you notice that not one answer, I swear. As long as I've been teaching this class, not one time has somebody said they really knew how to plan a lesson or I loved their assessments. So that's the craft of teaching, right? It's, it's all the stuff we have to do. But that's not what your kids are going to remember. That's not the impact you're going to make. Teaching is all about relationships. Rita Pearson said she was a teacher for a very long time, and she said, if your kids don't like you, they ain't going to learn from you. That's the bottom line. You have to connect with your students, especially, I mean, all kids, all kids, doesn't matter what demographic they come from. But if you're going to work in a high poverty school, which I hope you do, um, those kids, that, that's where you need to break down those walls because they're not going to learn from you. It doesn't matter how good you are at the craft. If you don't have the art down, which is putting that student first and really getting to know what makes them tick and how they learn and what they love 
and what they're dealing with at home and making sure that you're taking that into consideration when you teach them. Um, and you're not going to get through to them and you only get 180 days to do that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rip you up inside sometimes as you get to know some of these kiddos. Um, but that's why we do what we do. So uh, I just want you to remember that it's always about the student. Um, make sure that when you're interviewing for positions, if you haven't been hired yet, that you're putting somewhere in every single one of your answers how it's always about the kids. Um, all right, so just a little advice for you there. So the art and craft of teaching, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, what we know about brain research and theory. We're going to talk about students. We're going to talk about curriculum. And you're going to apply those things that we learn into how to create a good lesson. We're going to talk about different strategies for teaching. And then we're going to talk a little bit about different assessment techniques, which, I mean, this is all very important, right? The, the instructional cycle is uh, assess, teach, and then and interpret the data plan, teach, assess, plan, teach, assess, plan, teach, assess, and you just keep going around the cycle. And you do that continuously through the year. So our course, you've seen the syllabus, you've seen the assignments, you've seen the grading. Um, the one thing I want to just really emphasize, like I said, I'm not here to make your life any harder than it is. I know most of you are working full time. Um, some, most of, some of you might already be in the classroom already. So you're enjoying a little bit of time off. I don't want to take that away from you. You need to recharge. Um, but at the same time, you're enrolled in a university. Um, and so my, the, the one thing I just want to encourage from all of you is get your work turned in on time. Um, it's, you've already taken 510, so you've seen how fast these courses go. If you get behind, I, I do ding you. I don't have time. I work full time as a superintendent principal. Summertime's a busy time for me because I'm getting ready for the school year. Um, so I'm going to, if you're, if you're turning in work late, I'm not going to put in the time to, um, you know, really go the extra mile to make sure that uh, I'm reading everything because I'm trying to stay caught up with everything that's supposed to be turned in on time. So you're going to get dinged if you don't have, uh, your work turned in on time. Um, or if you're missing your APA, um, citations, if you're, I don't want you taking credit for something that somebody else thought of. And it's, that's okay. You can absolutely turn in work early and uh, get, it, get it out of the way. If you, if you want to start turning in your week four, five, six stuff, um, go for it. Knock yourself out. All right, tonight's objective, you're going to utilize knowledge of brain research, learning theories, uh, child and adolescent development to inform instructional practices. This is one of my favorite classes, actually, of the eight weeks. Um, I really dove into learning about this when I first started teaching just about the all the latest development in adolescent brain development. So that's what we're going to get kicked off doing and talking about. Any questions before we get rolling? All right, buckle up. Here we go. So what do we know? What do you know? about uh, the brain, the teenage brain especially, or the developing brain that is applicable to teaching. What do you know about the, the developing brain that you should know about the brain if you're gonna be in the classroom, especially fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, I'd say fifth grade through sophomore, junior in high school. Anything you know? This is a teaching strategy. It's been around for a long time. It's called KWL. You want to see what your students know, what they want to know, and then you're going to reset what they learn. Okay, so I'm seeing not fully developed, risk-taking, puberty. Uh, you're going to see Bianca tonight. This is less about puberty and more just about the brain. So less about, the, less about chemicals and more about brain development. Yes, L'Oreal, you're all over that prefrontal cortex. Yes, the brain is not fully developed, and we're going to talk about that. So, good. Sounds like there's some good background knowledge already. Um, why is it important to have an understanding of how the adolescent brain works in order to be a teacher? So, so their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed. So what? 
How is, why do you need to know that as a teacher? And this is one, as I read your discussion boards, I see a lot of people, they put their kind of their parent hat on um, and they say, yeah, I've, I totally, I'm understanding my own kids. And that's good because, you know, heaven forbid, we, I mean, we were, we're parents first before we're teachers. That's the most important thing. But, but we want to really think about as a teacher, why is it important that I know how the, the, the teenage brain works? Yeah, you got to have empathy. You got to have patience for some of you. When, when a student, when you ask a kid, how many times have you said, what were you thinking? And they look at you and go, I don't know. Well, you're going to find out that teenagers and adolescents, that, that is actually the right answer. You have no idea what they were thinking. It's, it's more of a reaction. It's incredible. Yeah, we're going to talk about Murphy is what does appropriate instruction look like for a developing brain? All right, so we're going to watch a quick video, nine minutes. Let me know if it works on your screen. How's the sound? Hi, thank you. All right, let me see here. No sound, don't see anything. Your screen sharing is paused. Why did it pause it? Please move this window away from. All right, I see what I have to do. Hold on. Bear with me, folks. This is, we're going to stop sharing the PowerPoint. And I'm going to share a video. How's this? Do you see it now? Okay, let's see if you can hear it. Love, love your can you hear it? Sweet. into your mid-20s. So most of you in this room today, as middle and high school students, don't yet have a fully mature brain. But it's actually really beneficial if we think about one of the functions of adolescence, which is to establish your independence from a caregiver. Because your brain, as an adolescent, is built to help you do that. Compared to children and adults, the teenage brain is really good at seeking out new experiences, enjoying thrills, and seeking out risks. It's also really good at recognizing social or being sensitive to social and emotional information. And so for that reason, the teenage brain is really um, responsive to, to rewards and emotions when making decisions. And in my laboratory at UCLA and laboratories all around the world, we're interested in uncovering that very question. How does the teenage brain make decisions? One of the first discoveries uh, relevant to this uh, topic was made when we discovered um, that the part of your brain in the very front, called the prefrontal cortex, which is the last brain region to develop, because your brain develops from the back to the front, um, continues to change up until the mid-20s. And the reason this is relevant is because the prefrontal cortex is a part of your brain that helps you think about the consequences or potential consequences of your actions before you do them. It helps you regulate your behavior and your emotions. And so it makes sense that if this part of the brain isn't fully available into well past adolescence, then teenagers may make more impulsive decisions with less regard for the potential future consequences. But we now know that the story is far more interesting and complicated than that. And in fact, what we really need to do is think about um, how brain regions that are not at the surface of your brain but in the deeper layers, how they change. And one region we focus on is called the striatum. And the striatum is the key component of the reward system. So when you receive something that you find rewarding, your striatum is very responsive, and it releases something called dopamine. 
And this is the case not just in humans, but in kids, in, in mice, in, in rats, in monkeys. All of these organisms respond really with a lot of excitement in their brain when they get something they like. So in my lab, we, we study this, this reward system across development, and especially in teenagers. And we do that by asking people to come to the laboratory and perform what's called an, a functional magnetic resonance imaging scan, or fMRI. And the beauty of fMRI is that you can take a snapshot of the brain in motion. So while you are experiencing something you like, or while you are making a decision, we capture how your brain is responding to that, how your brain is active. And um, so to study the reward system, what we did is not simply show people pictures of reward, which is what mostly happens in, in, in brain imaging studies, but instead what we did is we actually gave some a re someone a reward. And what's something that people find rewarding? Sugar. So what we did is we um, asked people to come to the lab. We asked a group of teenagers and a group of, of adults. And while we, they were in the MRI, we hooked them up to a straw. And we fed them squirts of sugar water every so often. And first we asked them whether they liked it. Maybe, maybe they weren't going to like the sugar as much as we thought. But they actually did. This is a rating scale asking them, how much do you like the sugar? And the average response is, is in red for the teenage group, and the adults is shown in white. And you can see that everybody liked it, but it's the teenage group who showed this exaggerated sensitivity. They really liked it. So we started to wonder whether there was something neurobiological that represented this difference. So instead of focusing on the prefrontal cortex, which is what a lot of brain scientists who study adolescents do, we looked at the deeper layers of the brain. So in this image, which is actually a, a real human uh, brain image, averaged together among all our participants, we saw that in the deeper layers here represented in, with this red, act, or sorry, this yellow activation, um, the striatum was really excited to the sugar, to the sugar water. And this was across all age groups. But the really cool thing um, was observed when we looked at the differences between the teenagers and the adults. Here again, I'm showing you the magnitude of activation, that is, how excitable the brain was in the teenagers compared to the adults, to so this very simple reward of sugar. And you can see that the teenagers were much more excited to the same exact stimulus and in the same exact region of the brain. It's the teenage brain that was going crazy. It was really excited to get it. And when we associated that with their ratings of the sugar, it was only in the teenage group where we saw that people who showed greater activation in the brain in response to the sugar also told us they liked it more. So that means that in real time, at the very moment your brain gets something that it likes, it will make you think that it's better. And you can think or imagine that in future um, circumstances, You'll, your brain will encode that information and remember that you liked it. So we'll, it will bias your decisions toward getting more rewards. And that's what happens during adolescence. But to ensure that this wasn't just specific to something as simple as sugar, we gave people something else that everybody likes. And we did this while they were in the MRI. And what's something else that everyone loves to get? Money, right? Money. Everybody likes money. So we brought in a whole separate group of teenagers and adults, and this time we threw in a group of, of kids in there who were between about 7 and 10. And we found that, again, the part of the brain that was most responsive was this striatum, shown here on the left. This is a brain scan showing the average activation. But what you can see really clearly is that not only were the teenagers more reactive to the money than the adults, which you might argue is because maybe they have less of it, and they like it more, but, it's, but that's not the case, because the kids probably have even less than the teenagers, and the teens still showed, showed this exaggerated response. So this is telling us that there's something really special about the teenage brain. There's a, a sharp increase in sensitivity to rewards and novel information from childhood to adolescence, but then there's a sharp decrease from adolescence to adulthood. And that probably has something to do with the fact that the prefrontal cortex is starting to come online as people transition into adulthood and regulating the emotional response to the, to the, to the re rewarding information. So what does this all mean for behavior and for your everyday life? Well, there are a few things. 
Um, from my perspective, this is a really exciting time to study the teenage brain. Although scientists have made significant progress in understanding what makes the teenage brain unique, we still have a lot to learn. For instance, we're just now starting to appreciate that the sensitivity to, in the brain to, to rewards and to emotions um, might lead teenagers to make poor choices sometimes, but it also presents an excellent opportunity to seek out new adventures, to, to meet new people, and to confront in, interesting challenges in ways that people don't typically do later in life. And I predict that as we continue to conduct more of this research, we will learn how to take advantage of the sensitivity of the brain during adolescence to generate new ideas and to promote creative thinking. There's a lot that we can and will learn from the adolescent brain and from adolescents in general in the coming decade. And perhaps we'll learn that taking risks and seeking out rewards are really adaptive behaviors in many contexts that actually lead to really good decisions and that help individuals navigate the often challenging and intimidating transition from childhood to adulthood. So with that, I encourage you to, to savor the excitability of your teenage brain and to enjoy all the new people you meet and all the adventures you take. Thank you. All right. Thoughts, initial thoughts? Let me pull the chat up here. Where'd my chat go? Yes, it is very interesting. Hold on. I love the point that she makes up about, I mean, we always look at our teenagers at being so willing to take risks, which is, yeah, absolutely. When she talks about just how in tune they are with their emotional responses. We look at them as just emotional, you know, they're unstable and they get too emotional, but they're really in tune with other people's emotions as well. And that's something that we should think about as teachers um, and give them a little bit of credit. So, all right, so moving forward, we we think about so much has has happened in the last 20, 30 years when it comes to learning how the brain works. And uh, so they, they, they call the, the last decade of the 20th century as the decade of the brain. We started seeing new technologies for imaging so that we could see, you know, she showed some images up on her, her um, presentation where it showed just how neurons were firing and lighting up and and so we're understanding how, not just how, what the brain looks like, but we're seeing what areas of the brain function when they're stimulated with external things. And it's really helping us to understand. Um, so some of those things, and we're going to kind of just breeze through this because unless you're teaching this class, you probably aren't going to need to know this to be a teacher in, in the public schools. Um, but an EEG, this is where electrodes are placed and it measures brain waves and brain activity and how neurons respond to specific events. Uh, she talked about the MEG, right? So this is done with magnets. It gives a very accurate resolution of the timing of activity. So um, when, when something happens, it just gives an immediate reaction so you can see how certain events stimulate the brain immediately. Down to the millisecond, it says, right? So the next one, is um, the CAT scan, right? We've all heard of a, having your CAT scan. Um, Two-dimensional x-rays combined with a cross-section, which gives three-dimensional images. And so CAT scans can detect brain damage um, and, and blood flow. So it helps us to understand how things are working there. A PET scan, which when they inject a little bit of radioactively glucose into your bloodstream, this is where, this is really cool when you see um, different images. So here's a couple of images in this slide where you see a normal brain and you see a brain with Alzheimer's. Um, I've, you know, I have a couple of family members that I've lost due to Alzheimer's. And that's, you see it. I mean, you see this, this deterioration from this normal brain to this along the road. And it's, uh, it's heartbreaking. But they're starting to understand it a little more. And, you know, with understanding comes... Um, 
you know, comes different ways that we can address some of these problems. So hopefully, hopefully doctors can figure that out. Uh, the brain is 75% water, 10% fat, 8% protein. Um, 2% of the body's uh, adult weight and consumes 20% of the energy. So you need, think about when people say, oh, I'm eating brain food. Well, it's true. You got to eat, you got to have the, you know, high protein, high fat food actually does give your brain energy. Uh, brain uses eight gallons of blood per hour, provides fuel in the form of oxygen and glucose, and uses about one fifth of the oxygen in your body. And water is required to move neuron signals, right? One of the first uh, symptoms of being dehydrated is, is kind of not lose, you kind of lose your, your thoughts and you can't focus and because you're, you know, things are thickening up. So moving slower through your brain and the rest of your body. A fully developed brain weighs three pounds um, and it's made up of at least 100 billion neurons. I don't know who counted those. That was a cruddy job. Uh, so taking a look at some of the things here that what neurons look like and, and the key word here is a, a synapse. So these are the connections that, that synapses connect. Um, and that's, that's when things lock in. That's when, when, when you're, when you're, when there's connect connections of your synapses, that's when you're learning. That's when new things are being developed. That's when, uh, you know, was, kids are listening to music or when reading or all sorts of all sorts of new learning occurs it's those connections that are happening so that the pathways in the brain can be revisited right so think of a think of a bridge you know two or two sides of a river right you can't make a connection until you build that bridge and once the bridge is built traffic froze, flows freely well that's that synapse easier is the bridge um, between neurotransmitters and neuroreceptors and so those bridges are what causes new learning so nerve cell growth at five days six years an adult look at that six-year-old brain look at the growth happening right so you think about all those synapses that are connecting it's amazing, right? So even, even at five days old, there's connections being formed. And that's what you're seeing, the spider web looking images. Those are the connections of neurons, right? So that six-year-old brain is just, they're learning by touching and everything they do, smelling, talking, playing. They're, they're, everything they do between really those first five, six years, they're making so many connections. It's, it's amazing. So then we talk about processing. And as you, if you're getting into special education, um, it's really about processing, right? So there's, there's fast processing and slow processing. When a student qualifies for special education, it's usually because they have a processing delay, right? So it could be um, uh, processing in expressive or receptive or uh, those two areas, you know, they, they can't, they can't see things well or understand things well. Or um, so when we look at the fast processing is that blue arrow. So it, it, it goes into the, the, thalam the thalamus, like she talked about, then to the amygdala, which is the, the emotional center of the brain, then to the cerebellum, right? Well, slow processing starts at that same spot and then moves towards the, the uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, so where that cerebellum happens is, is that's where that, that thinking part in the back there, you're, 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 you're really making connections quicker. Sensory goes to the thalamus, like I said, the sensory relay station. Brain determines if uh, the information contains any emotional meaning, and that happens in the amygdala. And if the sensory information indicates that a person might be in danger, that information is processed quickly through the amygdala, and it goes to the cerebellum where it controls body movement, which is attached to their spine. And then with slow processing, and I try to move that. If the information does not have any negative emotional impact or overtones, it's processed slowly going from the thalamus to the cortex, which you just think about it. All right, hold on a second. So, I want you to remember brain basic number one. Emotions are the gatekeeper to learning, right? We just talked about that amygdala. It's the gatekeeper. Everything gets processed through that amygdala. So we think about, think about emotions. How can we, we think a lot, of, a lot of times in the classroom, we're thinking about emotions with such a negative 
as a, as a negative thing. Oh, they're so emotional. But think about how you can tap into your students' emotions for, in a positive way. If that's the gatekeeper to learning, if you're not going to get your students to learn unless you can connect with them emotionally. That was one how we talked about relationships being so key to learning. But think about how can you teach through emotions? Think about the words you use to describe your favorite teacher. All of those words were, just, were, were words that could be linked to a feeling you had. They, they were, you felt loved. Uh, they were kind. They were energetic. These are all emotions. These are, they, this is how your teacher made you feel. And that's why you remembered them. So think about when you're delivering a lesson, when you're teaching your students, which is, yeah, we want to, we absolutely want to put that relationship first. But I mean, your job, if we're looking at the, the nuts and bolts, your job is to teach kids. Your job is to make sure that if they come into your classroom on day one, that they leave at least a year, learn at least a year's worth of knowledge before they leave your room, hopefully more. So in doing your job, how can you use emotions to help them to learn, if to lock in things to, to help build that long-term memory? We could talk a little bit about that throughout the term through project-based learning and, and things like that. Sensory teaching. So you think about sensory teaching. Here are some, we think of our, 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 ascent, our five or six, five senses, right? Sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell. Well, think about balance, movement, temperature, pain, um, ultraviolet, ionic, proximal, uh, electrical, barometric, all these different senses that are out there. How can you use those to teach? I had one of my sixth grade teachers was teaching a lesson on uh, ancient civilizations is, is sixth grade curriculum. And she was teaching a, a lesson on ancient India and she brought curry into the classroom. She didn't do, she just put it in the classroom. So when the kids walked in, what do you think they filled them up? The smell of curry. Those students totally remembered everything about that lesson. Now, had she not brought the curry in, she just would have been lecturing about something that they didn't care about, but she triggered a sense right? She got them think, gosh, what is that smell? And then at the end of the lesson, she said, what you've been smelling this whole time is a spice or a combination of spices that is, was developed in India and is used in a lot of Indian cooking. How many of you have smelled that before? And she started making connections. Beautiful teaching. That's the difference between the craft of teaching, which she would have gotten up there with a lesson and taught and the art of teaching, right? Making that emotional, that sensory connection to what students were learning. So you think about that with every single lesson plan you write and everything you, every time you teach and all the lesson development you do, how can you plug in to students' senses and their emotions, right? That's that gateway. Emotions are the gateway. How many times do you remember a lesson where you got to eat something? I mean, me, gosh, I, I love food. Who doesn't love food, right? But you're thinking about, gosh, you know, you, you learned, just learned about Mexico and you wrap it up by tasting different salsas or uh, different foods from the region. Or, or you might learn about, you know, uh, Germany and you do the same thing, right? It makes a connection, right? It, it gets you to remember what you learned about as long as you could tie it into the lesson and not just eat, smell stuff. So we want to think about sensory rich experiences, right? We, we think about the, the most sensory rich is actually being there right? Being somewhere. That's why when you think about, you know, to me, as I've been an educator in California and lived in California my whole life, diversity to me in California, it, it, it means something different here than it does the rest of the country. We look, you live in California your whole life. You've grown up with people of every color and cultural background your whole life. You don't see people based on their culture and color in California. We, we're Californian, right? I mean, that's just one of the cool things about our state. But there is a diversity in our state, and that diversity, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, um, is the diversity is socioeconomic, right? There's definitely a class stature. There's the haves and the have-nots in California, and they are separated. Students that have in California, that have the money, that have parents and power and, and influence, they have these sensory rich experiences in their lives where they go so many places. They go all over, they travel the world, they go away on the weekends, they're gone over Christmas, summer vacations are spent abroad, all these different things. 
you get into poverty and you think about my tiny little community of Lagrand, and I have students who haven't traveled eight miles to the next city that have never been to Taco Bell. I remember when I took my students on a field trip to San Francisco and we were going over Altamont Pass, which is, it's a hill, it's 1,100 feet. And they asked, Mr. Borba, are these the mountains? I mean, they, they hadn't had those sensory rich experiences. And so we have to provide those. And with limited budgets, how do we give our students that being their experience, right? We'll recreate it. Why can't we recreate? One thing I've, I've loved technology for this reason is virtual reality. Have put a virtual reality headset, take your students on a Google expedition and let them go diving in the Great Barrier Reef before you read about it, before you study about it. Let them walk across the Serengeti and see animals moving. And if you can fill your room with scents and smells and, and sounds to, to accompany the, 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 what they see, you're, you're, you're getting them there, right? You're bringing them to that, that higher, that more sensory rich experience. As opposed to what most of our kids get which is secondhand or symbolic representation, right? We think about, okay, I'm going to teach a unit on Africa, so I'm going to bring in a tribal mask. And, and we've often been praised for, oh, that's good, that's realia. But that is so far away from actually being there, right? Obviously, you can't take your students to Africa, but how close can you get them? Think about technology. It's opened up our world to get them closer to Africa than they've ever been. And so I want you to put that, that hat on as you're a teacher and you're creating lessons. How can you get them to that most sensory rich experience with your lessons? If you do that, what are you tapping into? You're tapping into emotions. And that's ba brain basic number one. Brain basic number two is that learning is a function of experience, right? The more sensory rich the experience, the better, which we kind of just hit that. And I don't think I have to beat that dead horse. And we're going to make sure that's a low sensory experience because I don't actually want to beat a dead horse. That's disgusting. All right. So I want you to read this paragraph here. Oops. Hold on a second. Try to hide that. There we go. I, I'm willing to bet that you noticed that there's a few typos, but you didn't have any trouble reading did you you did not have any trouble reading that paragraph why is that so we can read that because our brains are amazing our brains are pattern seeking devices you notice the patterns you're before you can't even you can probably look at it and go okay what's the pattern i don't even see the pattern but the thing is, is your brain is already, because you have uh, fluency, because you've, uh, you know how to read at a, you know, a 10th grade level or higher, you can decode this without actually decoding it and blending it like a first grader. If you were to present this same paragraph to a student who reads at a first or second grade level when they're still blending sounds together, they wouldn't be able to do it. But you, you already have all these words in your bank. So you just, boom, you shot right through it because your, your brain is already locked in and those synapses have connected. And so those, 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 those bridges between your neurotransmitters have already been connected. So you're, you've got information flowing across because you've already seen the word according a billion times. And that, that's crazy. And so we want to build those connections with our students. It's fascinating stuff. So factors affecting pattern perceivability are prior experience knowledge, like I talked about, firsthand, secondhand, symbolic mental wiring of the observer. And brain basic number three, the brain is a pattern seeking device. It's always looking and it's going to do it without even thinking, just like you blink without thinking, just like you breathe without thinking. Your brain does that for you. Your brain is looking for patterns constantly. We're going to have a little we're going to talk about memory here. So the capacity of short-term memory, can you, can you see through that chat or is that just, is that blocking like it is on my screen? I have to keep moving it. Is that okay? Okay. 
So the capacity of short-term memory appears to develop with age. The number of spaces increases by one unit every other year beginning at the age three. How, how cool is that, right? So five-year-olds can remember two spaces. 15-year-olds can remember seven spaces. This is crazy, right? So we think about it. Seven spaces. What do we know that's seven spaces? Right? Phone numbers, usually seven spaces. How about we play a little game? Let's see how good your memory is. Are you ready? I'm going to flash some numbers up on the screen, and I'm going to see if you remember them, because I'm going to put them up there, and I'm going to take them off. Here we go. All right. What was it? Write them in there. Write them in the chat. See if you got it. And if you're writing it like now, you can just copy everybody else's. I'm sorry. That's probably cheating. But anyway. All right. All right. Let's see if you got it right. Seven, four, nine, three, six, five, one. Seven spaces. All right. Here we go. Here comes the next one. Here we go. And we don't even have to remember phone numbers anymore because we have iPhones and I don't even know what my own phone number is. So it's crazy. Okay. All right. How many of you remember that one? No writing it down. <laughs> yep. See, we, this is fantastic, right? Five two one six three eight four seven nine four. Think of it. That's a phone number with an area code. Hmm. Maybe if you would have grouped it that way, you would have gotten it. All right. Let's try one more or a couple more. Here's this one's good. Here we go. See if you can remember this. Ready? Five seconds. Did you get it? <laughs> okay, watch your language, everybody. All right. So let's look at those letters. Look at those letters. But watch what happens if we group the same letters, same order. Here we go. You ready? Five seconds. See if you can remember it. All right. Do you remember it? You did a whole lot better, right? Because what happened? What happened on that last one? You grouped the same letters, which look, they're in the same order. You grouped them into something that what? What did you do? It's not even recognition. There's pattern, but there's a meaning, right? There's a connection. You made a connection. LSD. TV, FBI, JFK, USA. So in your brain, you probably thought 1964. That, that, that pretty much describes the whole year. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, all right. So long-term memory, declarative, it's semantic, episodic, procedural, emotional, it's automatic. Things, things that get locked into that long-term memory, right? It's, 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 it's there. It's there. Right. It's, it's, you you know, your procedures, you know what you do every morning, you know how it's, it's that, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a systematic, right? So it's also emotional. I still, there's certain smells that take you to a place and a time 30 years ago, or maybe for some of you 20 years ago, uh, but it brings you back, right? To the, the smell of fresh cut grass brings me back to the baseball field, right? Um, you think about all those things that, that, that trigger emotional responses that are in your long-term memories that trigger old memories from a long that you don't even know were in there. So you think about your memory storage. How are we doing on time? I don't even have a clock going. Oh my gosh, we have 16 minutes left. We got are you okay if we get moving a little faster? Sorry. I'm having fun with you guys. All right. So you have to use information in order to get it into long-term memory. What do you have to do with information in order to get it? Got to use it got to use it. So you think about all the things you, you crammed for a test in college. You got it in there. Short-term memory. You 
did great on the test. How many of you remember any of that stuff you crammed? None of it. Why? Because you didn't use it. But if you think about, think about something where you learned maybe how to cook something and then you went and you created it and you really liked it. So then you made it again. You probably start thinking about using that's been locked into long-term memory. Spanish. Yeah. Use it or lose it. Right. If you're not using language, you're going to lose it. If you're not, it's not like riding a bike because that's muscle memory, but you have to use things in order for it to go into long-term memory. We talked about this a little bit in the video, how the brain develops over time. This is before children are even born. So a newborn brain is totally developed, right? You're looking at three weeks of gestation. It's already starting to develop in there. Four weeks, five weeks. Look at how fast it's developing, right? And just a week at a time, seven, 11, four months, six months, eight months to a newborn child, you have a fully developed brain, totally functioning and firing away. So brain maturation occurs from back to front like we learned about in the video. Um, at age five, it goes, starts to look at, you can see all the firing going on before it gets to an adult brain where it's fully mature. Proliferation, it's the focus on the number of brain cells. Um, then there's pruning that has to, has to occur where brain cells that don't find a connection are gone. They, 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 don't, they get taken out, right? They get pruned. And so you think about uh, what happens is some people or some scientists are believing that autism might be the result of insufficient pruning during this pre-birth time where there's extra brain cells just left in the brain without any function. Windows of opportunity. I remember the first time I taught this, I felt like I was such a bad parent. I was like, oh, I totally messed my kids up. Anyway, so sensitive periods for, for kids in, in developing their eyesight and vision is birth to two years, hearing birth to 12 years. So don't let your 11 year old blast their headphones and listen to loud music, right? emotions are developing and the sensitive that first three years they're they're learning about love and caring and that's so important right why why a parent has to be present vocabulary those first six years a second language if you don't have that second language by the age of 10 man you're totally done now movement those first 10 years math hey math teachers you're off the hook if you're teaching anybody later than a four-year-old they can't learn i'm just kidding uh, but that's, think about all the things that happen right there too. Music, this is the one where I felt like a horrible parent. I was like, oh man, I should have done, given my kids piano lessons or something, but too late, blew it. All right, they can, they can I'll, I'll pay for a few rounds of counseling, I guess. Uh, second wave of proliferation between ages of six and 12. Uh, this focuses on the number of connections between nerve cells. And remember what those connections are called, right? Synapses, gray matter. Um, they're, they're talking about a connection between ADHD and Tourette's possibly because of the proliferation happening between the ages of six and 12. And that's when you see ADHD start to show up in school, in school age students is between these ages. And the second uh, wave of pruning happens from 12 to 25. Um, we look at the gray matter gets thinner, white matter gets thicker, a few but fewer but faster connections and then pruning is guided by either you're using it or you're losing it. So after 25, it's hard to learn new things, but there is good news. And we're going to talk about some research that came out of Stanford not that long ago in just a few moments here. Prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to develop. Planning, setting priorities, organizing thoughts, weighing consequences. All these things that as I, as I think about being a parent and as I think about being a teacher, these are all things we expect from our students and our kids at this age, but they're totally incapable of doing that. Think about it. The prefrontal cortex controls the executive functions right here, which are all things that we expect them to do. All right, write down your homework assignments for the next week, which is planning. Now pick the most important ones. Now, you know, organize your thoughts and write a good paragraph and do you want to go out and you know, hang out with your friends or do you want to do your homework? So, so we're basically asking them to be adults before their, their brain is even ready to be. What are, what are we doing? Right? I, I don't know. But we keep doing it. It drives me crazy. All right. So I don't know if any of you have heard of Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck is a Stanford uh, professor. Um, and this is a, a lecture she gave at Lewis and Virginia Eaton um, 
or no, I don't know where she gave this one, but she's at, at a Stanford university and she talks about growth mindset. So enjoy this video. Can you hear it? Thank you. Today, I want to tell you about the power of yet. Great. I learned in high school in Chicago where students had to pass 84 units to graduate. And if they didn't pass, they got the grade not yet. I thought, isn't that wonderful? Because if you fail, you're nowhere. But if you get the grade not yet, you're on a learning curve. Not yet gave them a path into the future. And not yet also helped me understand a critical experience early in my career. To figure out how kids coped with challenge, I gave 10-year-olds some problems that were a little too difficult for them. Some of them reacted in a shockingly positive way. They said things like, I love a challenge, or I was hoping this would be informative. <laughs> they understood that their abilities could grow through their hard work. They had what I call a growth mindset. But other children, for them it was tragic, catastrophic. From their more fixed mindset perspective, their core intelligence had been tested and devastated. Instead of the power of yet, they were gripped by the tyranny of now. So what did they do next? In one study, after a failure on a test, they said they'd cheat next time instead of study more. In another study, they found someone who did worse than they did so they could feel better. <laughs> and in many studies, we found they run from difficulty. Let's look at how that looks in the brain. Mosher and his colleagues measured from the brain as kids encountered errors. Processing the error shows up in red. If you look at the fixed mindset brain on the left, nothing is happening. But if you look at the growth mindset brain on the right, it's on fire with yet. They're processing the error deeply, learning from it, and correcting, correcting it. So. How are we raising our kids? Are we raising them for now or for yet? Are they focused on the next A or test score instead of dreaming big, instead of thinking about what they want to be and how they want to contribute to society? And if they are too focused on A's and test scores, are they going to carry this with them into the future? Maybe because many employers are coming to me and saying, we've already created a generation of young workers who can't get through the day without an award. <laughs> so, what can we do? How can we build that bridge to yet? First, we can praise wisely. Our research shows that when we praise kids for the process they engage in, their hard work, their strategies, their focus, their perseverance, they learn that challenge seeking, they learn that resilience. Praising talent, praising intelligence makes them vulnerable. There are other ways of rewarding yet. We teamed up with game scientists at the University of Washington to create a math game brain points. The typical math game rewards right answers right now, but not brain points. We rewarded process and the learning curve, so effort, strategy, and progress. The brain points game created more sustained learning and greater perseverance than the standard game. And just the words yet and not yet after a student has a setback where finding creates greater confidence and greater persistence. We also can change students' mindsets directly. In one study, 
we taught students that every time they pushed out of their comfort zone to learn something really, really hard and they stuck to it, the neurons in their brain could form new, stronger connections and over time they could become smarter. Those who learned this lesson showed a sharp increase in their grades. Those who did not showed a decrease. We have done this with thousands of students now across the country with similar results, especially for struggling students. So let's talk about equality. In our country, there are groups of kids who chronically show poor performance. And many people think that's inevitable. But when educators create growth mindset environments steeped in yet, equality can happen. Let me just give you a few small examples. One teacher took her Harlem kindergarten class, many of whom could All not right. hold a We're running out of time. I know you want to see the rest of that video. Carol Dweck is amazing. Read her book called Growth Mindset. There are actually books that now come along. You can buy on Amazon that the Growth Mindset Coach, the Growth Mindset uh, Planner, if you want to uh, implement this in your, in your classroom. I know my entire school, we're a Growth Mindset school. So we, the, our kids get monthly awards, not for um, achievement, but for showing perseverance or kids who show really cool strategies and approaches to problems. Um, they get rewarded for their growth mindset. So it's a powerful, powerful stuff. Um, definitely take the time to finish that video when I post the PowerPoint for tonight's lesson on Blackboard. So six tips for brain-based learning. Create a safe climate for learning. If kids are not safe, they will not learn. If they don't feel safe, remember, it's all about emotions. They have to feel safe. And think about the places your students are coming from. Just let that sink in. They come from traumatic places and they don't check the trauma at the door. They're bringing it on the campus. If they don't feel safe at home, you have a lot of work to do to help them to feel safe at school. And if you want them to learn, that is number one. Encourage a growth mindset. Emphasize feedback. Talk about giving feedback. It should be specific. It shouldn't be good job, way to go. It should be, hey, I loved how you did X, but here's what I would like to see next time. Get bodies and brains and gear, right? We want them to get moving. Our kids are so lazy. They're not kids. They're not outside playing anymore. We've got to get them up and moving. Start early and embrace the power of novelty. Get them excited. All right. We still have two minutes left. Crushed it one hour. Assignments due next week. We have a discussion. Some of you have already started posting on the amazing teenage brain. Try to post it. Uh, you know, I'll give you a little grace this first week, but all of your initial, your initial posts are um, due by Wednesday at 1159. Respond to two other students uh, before the next class meeting. Um, and that's due Sunday night at 1159. Uh, make sure that you're thoughtful and insightful and ask questions in your responses to others. It's a discussion. Um, and then always use APA citations. Uh, journal, six tips for brain-based learning, which we just talked about real briefly, is due by Sunday at 11.59. Okay. And assignment expectations, kind of covered those a little bit. Make sure that they're just thoughtful and uh, your peer responses are good. They're worth 10, five and five. Your peer response is worth five points. Your initial response is worth five points. Next week, we're going to be talking about how you as the teacher are the lead decision maker in the classroom. We're going to be talking a little bit about differentiated instruction and the sheltered um, instructional observation protocol or known as PSYOP discussion board journal entry and begin scheduling that observation or that Q&A with another teacher. And we're going to try a Kahoot. Uh, responses, just you only have to respond to two different just posts by your uh, colleagues, your peers. All right, Kahoot, here we go. So 
take out your cell phones or devices. And you're going to go to kahoot.it. Everybody log in to kahoot.it. Do not click on this link that I'm about to share. That's for me. And I think I already have it. Let me see here. My Kahoot. Share. And here it is. Play. So hopefully you're all getting on Kahoot.it. Where'd the chat go? Is there a game code? It's asking yeah, for a yeah. game Yeah, code. I'll give that to you in a second here. All right, here we go. The game code is 605154. Could have a little fun here. So I like to end most of the classes. It's a great tool to use in your classrooms. And we're going to start in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. The faster you get your answer, the more points you get. Connor in the lead, 830 points. Here we go. How much of the brain composition is made of water? Good job, 75%. Connor's still in the lead. Michelle, right on his heels. What are the gaps between brain cells which contain neurotransmitters called? Yes. Nice job. All right, Michelle and Connor. DK coming up. At what age do scientists now believe the prefrontal cortex to be fully developed? It is 25 years old, and it's actually, they're thinking for males, it could be even later, females sooner. I know that's, most women are going, yeah, duh, we knew that. But, all right. What is the most important word for those with a growth mindset? Ooh, somebody really put Colin Kaepernick. Come on, people. Yet, the power of yet. DK on fire. All right, here we go. Complete the sentence. are the gatekeeper to learning, not jelly beans. Man, this is staying. Complete the sentence. The brain is a pattern seeking device. That is right. Nice job. One more question. You all got that one right. Connor, congratulations, sir. You won our first Kahoot. All right. So we are going to, I'm going to stop sharing. 
All right. That is the conclusion of tonight's meeting. And uh, we will be here next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. I will see you there. If you, uh, I'll be posting the recording tonight on Blackboard. And if you have any questions, stick around. I'd be happy to answer them.